Okay, let's see. Can I open the chat? Okay, chat is there and open. All right, and people are coming in. Yay! We'll give everybody a second to to get settled. Okay. Pour yourself a cocktail. Or a <laughs> I actually I remembered water in case I checked on my own saliva, and I was like so proud of myself for that because I've done so many Zoom events where I've realized like, you know, thirty seconds after it started that I don't have any water and it's too late. You know. Oh my gosh. Well, that that is the good thing about us is we're so casual that you can just be like, <laughs> I gotta go, and you disappear. And be like that's fine, whatever. We'll just talk about ourselves. I actually was talking to my husband earlier because I have pajama pants on. Like I have like a a, a bodysuit uh -huh. with pajama pants, and I was like, that's fine, right? And he was like, unless you have to stand up. And I was like, okay, well, I won't <laughs> stand up then. I I did my whole book tour. Um, through Zoom because it was during COVID, my last one, and I did all of them in pajamas, every single one. And it was really fantastic. And now I kind of think that even when when I go back on real tour, I think I'm still gonna do it in uh in pajamas. Pajamas. I really regret before my first book came out, I almost bought myself the silk, black silk jumpsuit. Oh. And now they don't have it anymore. And I'm like, I should have bought that. That would have been the perfect, like event uniform because it's basically socially accepted pajamas you know yes exactly but now I'm still chasing it every now and then I google like black silk jumpsuit like but they're not they're not the same None no. of them are no. you're net you're never gonna find it actually you know what you are gonna find it and it'll be two sizes too small <laughs> three sizes too big it'll be on Poshmark and someone's trying to you know sell it for seven hundred dollars yeah yeah, you'd be like, but this was 45 when I saw it. <laughs> What's happening? All right. So, Amy, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I had mentioned this on social media before, but I've real I found out that you had um, chosen my book for your book club because all of a sudden I started getting all these like really excited messages from old friends, like college friends. They were like Jenny Lawson, and I was like, what? And that's how I found out because so many people that I knew were a part of this book club. So, thank you for making me seem like way cool to my <laughs> old friends. You are way cool. <laughs> Um, the, uh, yeah, I read this book and immediately I just thought, oh, this, this would be so much fun to, to read and to discuss and it's horror, but it also has some humor to it. And it's all, it has like so much going on. And, um, so let's see, first we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. So, um, so we'll talk for you know, a little bit and then we'll open up, um, if people have questions you can guys you can go into the chat or go to the uh let's see there's like a, a little thing at the bottom that says Q&A and so you can um put questions into the look at that there's an emoji that's an owl what oh my god that owl emoji has gotten a, a workout on my phone the past few months yeah <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> So if you guys have questions that I'm not uh, asking, feel free to go into the Q&A and drop them in there and we'll um, we'll make sure we get all of that. So, okay, so first off, so we have a couple of different book clubs here. And um, one of the things that we started doing with one of them is the uh, five weird questions. So I figured we could start with that. So the first question is, what would you do if you were in the zombie apocalypse? Oh, I don't want to say kill myself, but I might just kill myself. Um, I'm not. Uh, I just started lifting weights at the gym and I can barely like lift the bar over my head. So um, strength and speed are not my strong suits. I could probably like MacGyver some weapons, but I feel like I'm tagging out pretty, I, somebody's tagging me out, you know, like the zombies are going to get me pretty soon. I don't really estimate that I would have a very good chance. Same. Yeah. hundred percent same. No, I mean, am I going to watch my loved ones turn into zombies and have their brains eaten? Probably not. No. I think, I, I think that would be a good like stop gap where I would be like, all right, here's a good chance to like distract the zombies. 
just very early on before air conditioner goes away. Like when, when I can still, like, I still have a charge on my phone, but I'm about to lose it. Then I'd be like, I'm done. We're done. If there were like an option to like go to like an old shopping mall and like hole up there for a while or like a museum, I would be into that. I would probably try to, you know, keep the stronghold. But if I'm just in my house and they're like outside my house, actually my house is really old and we have a little tunnel underneath of it. So I could probably hide there. You have a tunnel under your house? house. It's full of crickets. It's disgusting, but it exists. Yeah. My house is really old. It was built in like the 1750s. Yeah. Get out. And Oh, okay. So let me just tell you one other thing. The place where I'm sitting right now, I don't believe in ghosts, but I have seen a ghost in my house and where I'm sitting is the exact spot in my house where I saw the ghost. Oh, that is so exciting. <laughs> so if I start doing really weird things, I might be possessed. Who knows? Oh my God. I Okay. First of all, I'm going to keep an eye out okay, the okay. entire time. Secondly, you guys know after this ends, we're going to be like, and Amy was dead two years earlier. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Uh, let's see. What is your favorite word? My favorite word. I have always been a fan of the word pulchritude, which means beauty. And it's like such a not, an unbeautiful word to say. Um, I love luminosity too. I really, I don't understand much physics, but I like reading physics because it includes like luminosity gap and cosmic backwater and any kind of word that comes out of physics that just I don't understand I usually like it I have I I have a note on my phone app that I if it's been there for years and I have no idea why it's there but it just says quasars like all caps quasars (laughs) I I don't know quasars is is a good portmanteau I guess oh that's so good um what is a book that everyone should read Oh, that's a hard one because I feel like there's not a one size fits all solution to books. But if I had to recommend a book that's that I always press into people's hands, I would probably say I love. Oh, gosh. You know, that thing where people say, what's your favorite book? And you're like, I've never read a book in my life. Yes. I feel like that right now. Um. Miriam Taves is one of my favorite writers and I love her books, but I think Fight Night to me is the one that I would probably recommend because it's just about like how humor carries you through everything, you know, and all of her books do that, but some of her books kind of go into harder places. So Fight Night by Miriam Taves, I think would be the one that I would recommend right now. All right. I have not read it. I'm putting it on my (laughs) list. How do you like your eggs? Oh, I like omelets and I like poached eggs. Very nice. And the last weird question is, will you be my friend? Yes, we're already, (laughs) we're already best friends. Yay. Perfect. Okay. So let's talk about this book. Um, And, and I, I will go ahead and say that we will probably very quickly get into spoilers. So if you haven't read this yet, um, you, you maybe have a couple of minutes before we get into spoilers, but you may want to just pause this and, um, and come back to it. We'll put it on, on YouTube. Uh, but we can talk about some other things first before we get into the, the ending. So tell me about what inspired this book. Okay. So, um, the parliament is two separate stories. There's a book within a book. So each book kind of came from each story has its own origin story really the main story is about a group of people who are trapped inside a library um and I have always wanted to write kind of like a siege novel because I think it's just so interesting the way it creates a pressure cooker you know you put these characters you trap them in a room together something's going to happen um and I was really thinking a lot about I've always wanted to write this kind of story because I'm obsessed with the book Bel Canto by Ann Patchett even though like this book is nothing like Bel Canto um So I had always kind of wanted to write a siege book and I wasn't sure how to do it. And, you know, it's just one of those things that's simmering in the back of the mind. And for a long time, I taught um, creative writing classes at a library where I lived in Connecticut and I taught young adult classes. 
And I loved these kids. Like they were my favorite people in the whole world. And I had not taught young adults before I started teaching at the library. I had taught college age students and they were just like so weird that like these are kids who first of all choose on a Thursday night when they have lots of homework, they're middle school students to come and do more work from like until 8 p.m., you know. So it's kind of a self-selecting group, but they were just so funny and weird and like generous with each other and like very vulnerable. And I was like, these kids like are the future, you know, like I believe the children are the future. But on the other hand, I was like, but we are trying to kill all of our children in every possible way. Because as a parent, you know, I send my kids out the door every day into a world where school shootings exist. And I lived in Newtown, Connecticut at the time. So like, that's always very much on my mind. But everything else, you know, we have climate change that we're just passing the ball down to our kids in the future or, you know, communicable de disease. And we're just like, oh, masks are hard to wear. So there are so many things that we kind of lay on our children and that we as adults kind of have to don't think about. Don't think about school shootings every day when you put your kids on the bus. Um, but but they exist and there's not, it's not something that we can solve necessarily as individuals. A lot of these things require communal solutions. So those kind of things all simmered together into one pot that had owls come out of it. So, and that's the, the library story kind of came from all those things, the amazing kids that I was teaching, um, just be spending a lot of time in the library building to um, really kind of I would be there for like six hours some days. So, you know, the room is so familiar. You kind of start to notice things that you haven't noticed. I'm like, oh, why don't they paint this fucking spot on the wall that's been unpainted <laughs> for two years? Um, there's also a fairy tale inside the book. And that one also has its own separate story. So the the book within the book is called The Silent Queen. And the main character is a queen who has traded her voice to a monster. And she has to go get it. And that kind of started simmering in the back of my mind a long time before that um, from a documentary called Searching for Augusta. And it's like a really infuriating documentary kind of because it's about this historian's search for this woman named Augusta Chiwi. She was a Belgian Congolese nurse in World War II. Um, she went missing as far as the historians knew after this kind of famous battle in Belgium. There was another nurse who was killed. So that's what everybody knows about the history of this. And so the whole documentary is about them searching for this woman. And then all of a sudden at the end, they're like, and then we found her. Here she is. Bye. And that was the end of the documentary. <laughs> but they were like, oh, but all the, by the way, she has selective mutism. And I was like, what are you? All the most interesting stuff was just like in the last 30 seconds of the movie. But and eventually she did, I guess, after the historian found her, she got treatment and she was able to talk about her experience. But I never stopped thinking about that idea that her trauma that she experienced was so um, intense that it took away her ability to talk about it. So that was kind of the seed of the story of the Silent Queen and this character who has no voice um, and has to, you know, find it. I love that. Um yeah. Because it, it goes back to um, the the owl story in so many ways of people who are, are dealing with trauma but can't talk about it or don't talk about it and that that silence can keep you from moving forward and, and um, you know, living your full life or making changes. Um, you know, what, what was interesting is the the two books in one were both my favorite part and the part that infuriated me because yep. every single time I would read and I'd be like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then you'd start, you'd be like, now it's the other book. And I'd be like, no, I want it. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. And then I would get into, and I would be like, oh, this is so good. This is so, and then I'd, and then you'd be, and I'd be like, okay, what's going to happen? God damn, now we're back with the murder house. Ah! But, but in a way it was so good because I have these two books that I really enjoyed and it kept reminding me how much I enjoyed both of them because I was so frustrated every time I would <laughs> away from them. Yeah, the, it, I think it's a bit divisive, but 
that's two books. I was like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure. Like, I don't necessarily like reading a book where you have to change storylines. And then I was just like, oh, that's what I wrote. So that's what it is. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I love the fact that you the all of these middle schoolers are, are, you know, a big part of this cast of characters because middle schoolers are terrifying, um, and almost in some ways, just as terrifying as the murder owls. Um, why owls? Oh, that's a good question. So, you know, I am discovering all these things about myself after I like do these interviews. I'm like, oh, I have this repressed memory about things. Like I have been writing about animal attacks for so long and I just forgot about all of them. I kind of like owls. I'm like not an, an anti-owl person. There was a time when my younger son was three and he was getting ready to go to preschool and he asked me for an owl backpack. And I was like, got this, no problem, owl backpack. So I you know, begin on what I think is going to be an easy task. And every owl backpack is pink or purple. And the owls all have big, cute eyes with like eyelashes. And like, A of all, why are owls gendered? B of all, like, why are owls like feminine? Like they're birds of prey. Why? Like these are birds of prey. I was so mad about it for like two months. I walked around and I was like, did you know that owls can fly in near silence? Did you know that owls could crush you with their talents? Like, you know, owls are like, they're scary. They're impressive. And I was like, we're not, we don't like respect owls enough, you know? So that's part of it. In terms of birds that scare me, I think hawks are way scarier to me. I have a real vendetta against hawks. I used to like have to carry a stick in my yard to go check the mail because the hawks would swoop down. But I don't think the hawks really deserve the visibility. So I think owls are like, there's a lot of symbolism and kind of meaning wrapped inside of owls and I liked the idea that just by virtue of it being an owl kind of you already start wondering like what is this supposed to represent yeah the um you know when I was growing up my I love 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 owls and uh, my grandmother would always say like actually if you see an owl that's not good especially if you see <laughs> in the daytime because if you see an owl in the daytime it means somebody's gonna die and um, so then, then I really wanted to see one um, just to see like if it was gonna happen. And now we actually have an owl that lives in the backyard. His name is Alexander Hamilton. And <laughs> so far, knock on wood, we're all okay. But, um, but yeah, uh, let's see. So let's talk a little bit about the, so we're, gonna, we're getting into spoilers now. Um, one of the things that was so frustrating was the 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 police not helping nobody's there they are basically on their own like on their own to the point where it's like everyone else is it, it's actually worse uh they're everybody is making it worse um so where where did that come from so i mean part of it is like i live in a small town i've lived in small towns for a long time and i know there's just sometimes like it's impossible to get anything done because there's like so much politics and infighting and you're just like what is going on but the incompetence that inspired it was really like more federal for me because you know I wrote a lot of this you know the the library story especially was like early pandemic when I was writing it and I was like the government is not good at anything they're not good at like helping people you know and if they're failing on such a huge scale on something that like every other country in the world is doing and modeling what we could do, you know, who, who having a small crisis has a chance, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because as I was reading it, I, my first thought was, oh, this isn't what would happen. This is, you know, Twitter would get involved and everybody would, but, but then you, you know, you cut off the internet and I'm like, oh, okay. All right. If, if the outside doesn't know, this is probably exactly what would happen. This is exactly the thing that, and then four years later, we'd see a documentary and go, are you fucking kidding me? What? <laughs> uh, this is absolutely, because every single time I was like, just drop a walkie talkie in the thing. Just do what, <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you doing? Oh my God. But it is absolutely the kind of stuff that would happen in, in, in real life. And it, it created such a like 
locked door horror, which was so um, claustrophobic, but at the same time, um, such a great way of having these characters mesh together. Even the, some of the characters who I just did not like at all, but but as they came together, I was like, you know what, as a group, humanity has a hope, like we can work together in small groups. If we work together and that camo guy goes out and dies first, then <laughs> we're all gonna, we're gonna be fine. Um, I finished the book and I was actually like, you know, I think this is like the least realistic ending possible that like people work together and solve the problem because you know it was just at a time when I was just like nobody nobody wants to do that you know so I, I don't know if it's like a realistic idea that people would but it certainly seems possible <laughs> I bet it feels it feels realistic to me when you have the people the infuriating people the the lady who you know was like I gotta go because I have to go to a, my daughter's wedding and I have to and all of the people who because there's something about when you when you have like a group of people and they all come together and they all have a common and they and the, but this was so great because every one of them I was like oh this person's a wild card don't trust that person <laughs> oh even the people when they would go out and they would do you know like like Winnie where I was like oh yeah go for it Winnie no no don't go for it what are you doing <laughs> um I I just I thought it was really great were were there any characters um. Like when you write them, do your characters, do they sort of tell you this is what they're going to do? Or are you like a, I know exactly how this is lined up. I'm going to write it the way that I want to write it. Um, so I am really bad at plot. Like I know for myself, plot is the thing that I'm not good at. So I spend a lot of time before I start writing, kind of creating that scaffolding because I know it needs to be there. And then I have an idea about the characters, but what I've learned about myself and really fought a lot when I was younger, but have just kind of come to accept is that it takes me a really long time to understand my characters. Like it might take me 60,000 words of writing to understand who a character really is. So it's not so much, I don't think like the characters telling me who they are, but it's like, I have to spend enough time with them to get to know them and for them to form as real people in my brain, you know? And I mean, there's no, there's no, I mean, I've done character, you know, there's worksheets, there's exercises people do, but there's no like cheat for me. I just have to spend the time is really what it comes down to. So who was your favorite character? Oh gosh. Who was my favorite character? I really love all the kids. Um, I think they're like way, you know, the kids is a group. I think Harper especially is, is a favorite for mine. Um, Nash is is also up there. I feel like people are always like, oh, Nash, the stupid jokes. But those are like my husband's jokes. So <laughs> I'm kind of fond of Nash. Yeah. Those are those are very big dad jokes. I, I told my husband every one of them and he was like, oh, that's good. I'm going to write that one down. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been hearing those over and over again. <laughs> um. Let's see. So one of the things that um, that I really enjoy about horror, actually speaking of, um, because this book, I mean, I picked it as a, a horror book and clearly it is a, you know, creature feature sort of zombie-esque murder owl, but it is also very much, it could be just a drama that just happens to have some murder owls in it. In it. What do you consider this book? You know I was surprised when people started like labeling it as horror because I was like, oh, I didn't realize that I wrote a horror novel. Um, I don't know. I kind of just think of everything that I write as like speculative and it's like under an umbrella. We all kind of sway <laughs> side to side and, you know, fantasy and horror and sci-fi all kind of just blend together like little watercolors. So I kind of just, I don't, I, you know, and it's, I love walking into a bookstore. When the book came out, I went to one in New York and they had it in the thriller section. And I was like, I wrote a thriller, I'm so excited. But you know, you have to trust booksellers to know like where their customers are gonna find your book on the shelf. They know who's coming in and where they're gonna find it. So um, yeah, I, I 
usually land on speculative, but I'm always like delighted when people are like, oh, I love your, it was so scary. I was like, oh, I didn't think it was scary, but I'm so excited that you were scared. <laughs> I, I sent it to my, one of my, I, my favorite college teacher, her name's Fran and she's like probably in her eighties. And I sent her my first book and she wrote me like this really great letter. And I said, send me your next one. And I sent her this one. And I didn't think like, oh no, this is going to be too scary for Fran. She sent me back a letter saying that it caused her to have um, anxiety and she had to read Jane Austen every night before she went to bed. And I was like, oh God, I'm so sorry, Fran. Um, you know, it, it's funny because I, um, I love horror. Um, and I think part of the reason why I love it is because it allows me to exercise my own anxiety with um, scenarios that are very unlikely to happen. And so I can actually, I, I don't have to be like, oh my God, what if murder owls come tomorrow? <laughs> um, but, but it was, um, it was interesting because there was so much in here that truly was terrifying that had Thing to do with the murder owls where I was <laughs> like you know because you you talk about um you know child's death and you talk about school shootings and you talk about and and I I loved that all of these stories were told um but all of them were told while never leaving the library which is filled with stories um and so I I thought that was really good job Thank you. Sorry, that's not that's not a question. I should I should have phrased that as a question. Did you do that on purpose? Sorry. <laughs> that's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> so sorry. Um after I so I, I read it the first time and then I read it a second time, and then today I read it a third time because I have a terrible memory. And so I never remember the details. And the third time that I read it. I thought, because the first two times I read it, I just enjoyed it as a single, um, like a, a story, like a two-part book story. And it was, you know, enjoyable and thought-provoking. But then when I got to the um, the end, I kept thinking like, does it does it mean something more? Like are the, the, the owls and the school shootings and the, and all of that, does that go back to the fact that we ignore things that aren't right in our face, that we, um, you know, don't pay attention to them. We don't learn from our mistakes out of sight, out of mind, or is it more of just like, this is a story, take it and do what you will. Yeah. I mean, I, f I feel like that's up to the reader really, but for me that one of the moments that kind of put the book into focus for me when I was writing it was I was researching there's a scene where you know Mad the main character and her friend are going through um, newspapers to try to figure out have these owls been seen anywhere else and uh, Mad is kind of reading about all these things that have happened in other countries that she hadn't heard of like a tsunami a, a fire in Siberia uh, an explosion in Lebanon that killed like hundreds of people and these were all real things like I just started looking like what are some things that have happened recently and I was like oh what the hell? Like I read the paper. I'm, I read the news. Like I'm relatively informed, but there's so much stuff happening everywhere all the time that it's impossible to function as a human and take it all in. But you know, everybody, there are people everywhere who are experiencing their own like tragic <laughs> traumatizing event, you know, all the time. So, um, and, and we don't notice and we don't, you know, a lot of times nobody's sending help to those people so um it's kind of like a, it's fantastical but it's also kind of a, a, a dramatization of something that's like very commonplace which is just like random tragedy striking random people who then have to live with it so I think that is kind of like a common thread between the two books too you know it's how do you how do you live in a world where <laughs> where bad things happen. Bad things happen, yeah. Exactly, yes. Um, the Okay, so I don't know if there really is an answer to this, um, but but why? But why were the owls there? Why were they, what, is there, I mean, I, I picked up, you know, little, little pieces and clues and the guy kind of shows up that's sort of a FBI, but not really, and he, he kind of hints that maybe there could be something spreading, but he doesn't really, and he kind of disappears. Is there, was there a, in your mind, like a here's why, or was it just a, 
let's just put it out there as a mystery. I like to leave it hanging as a mystery because I think, you know, for me, it could be, I, sometimes I think about it and I'm like, yes, this is a prelude to something else that's going to happen. You know, I was just reading something about the ocean temperatures and I was like, you know, we're destroying all of the animals' habitats. Like we're destroying the earth for animals. Eventually something, you know, the owls are attacking boats, you know, the animals will eventually have to go somewhere, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. To me, the owls are for the reader to interpret <laughs> as opposed to for me to put an interpretation on. You know, I think a lot of the owl stories that have already been out there, especially like um, the birds, the short story that inspired the Hitchcock movie in part, um, t is written just after World War II. And then there's another famous book called The Birds that was written just after World War One, And I think a lot of the most common representations of like animals attacking birds kind of descending are kind of like a um, metaphor for either like a xenophobic society, like having other people come in or um, like Britain being invaded by other countries. It's kind of like an invasion metaphor. And I didn't want to make the metaphor be too direct because I think the things that hover over each of us and come for us are so different. I love it. Um, the, the thing that I kept going back to was the, I don't know if you've ever seen the documentary, what is it called? The Staircase. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, pause this, go watch <laughs> The Staircase. It is insane. It is this true crime it is nuts. Um, it's It actually came out years and years ago, but then they did a new one. And it was basically like this mini series following this guy who may or may not have murdered his wife. And you and, and the entire time I'm watching it, I go back and forth and I'm like, oh, this guy 100% murdered his wife. And then I'm like, oh, he totally didn't. Oh my God, I can't believe I thought that. Oh my God, this guy's a murderer. Back and forth and back and forth. And the big thing that he um, really pushed after quite a while, it's basically this this woman supposedly fell down a staircase and um, and died. But then basically everybody who looked at it was like, no, she's got like these massive, you know, cuts and cracks and just so much blood. There's no way this could have happened on this tiny little staircase. And so the the big theory now is that she was attacked by a murder wolf, a murder owl. And that um, that an owl attacked her, and that that's what all the scrapes and the and that's why she kept falling down is because an owl kept attacking her, and um, and it was funny because when I first saw like the murder owl, I was like, oh my god, maybe this. I is can't believe I've never heard of this. <laughs> so you gotta go watch. <laughs> oh, it is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, go watch it. That's and wild. You know, I. Cannot wait to learn about why they think an owl attacked this woman. It's such a Did they find like owl pellets nearby? There, or there was a tiny infinitesimal, uh, like like microscopic uh owl feather that was found, but like I think they have feather beds and stuff. And I don't even know if it was owl, but like some feather was uh so yeah, there's no real rhyme or reason to it. But it's basically just following you, they're living with this guy while he's being um tried for murder and you just got oh my gosh it is fascinating and the further along you go this guy might be a serial killer I think he might have killed a bunch of people wait no no he didn't he didn't no he's a he's a saint oh my god this guy for real everybody go watch the staircase it's it's so it's so good um yeah sorry I got way I'm off sold that. I'm sold I'm watching <laughs> it's so good it's so good um uh, let's see. So, um, so I, so in some ways I expected it to, to end with a very like, what's going to happen next? Um, and, and it did, but it's still, I loved that you wrapped up the, like all of the people I felt like they were taking care of, well, the ones that survived, like they were taken care of, they still had a life. Um, they, they went on in a positive way. Um, and I just found that very comforting. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Uh, so the Q&A is open if you guys have any questions. Um, but if you don't, I'm going to move on to my next, which is 
what is next for you? What are you, what are you going to do next? Okay. So, um, you're not going to believe this, but I'm working on a haunted house book. That's based on my house because when we first moved into this house, um, my husband found this doll in the yard and it's like about this big and it's like gray green. Cause it's been in there. So the, we bought the house from people that we know my husband's boss and he had two daughters who are going to college when we bought the house. So probably the doll had been in the yard for, you know, 15 years bald. It had like vines coming out of the arms, little creepy doll. He hides it in my little gardening caddy. I'm like, oh, no. now it's my turn. I hide it for so- somewhere for him to find. At one point I hid it in the grill, like right before the end of fall. So like he didn't find it until the next spring and he kept being like where is the doll seriously and I was like you're gonna find it you're gonna find it someday you're gonna just it'll be there it's hidden so I thought what if a family moved into a house and they found a doll and they were too busy pranking each other with a doll to realize that their house was actually haunted and like sometimes the doll was moving on its own and so that's what I'm working on oh my gosh yeah it's also about like the horror of like modern domestic life and <laughs> suicidal ideation and all kinds of other fun things. Oh, I'm a hundred percent in. Um, so how do you know the, like the history of your house? Is there a reason that it, that it would have a haunting or just the normal stuff of a house that's been around that long? Yeah. So at one of my events for my first book, the woman who lived here for 30 years in the 70s came and brought me all of her records about the house. And she traced it back to, we were told the house was built in the 1750s and probably moved, which tracks because there's a bunch of reservoirs around here. Because in the 1800s, New York City started running out of water. So they just, they would take entire towns, they would put them on rails, they would put laundry soap to like lubricate them. And people would live in the houses while they were like moving them. So kids would go to school and then they would come home and just follow the trail of houses to figure out where their house was for that day. So at some point we think our house was moved here around 1800. And then the first people who lived here, the husband was like a veteran of, I can't remember which war, but his wife was the first cousin of President John Tyler. So the president's cousin, I I mean, he probably had 800 cousins, but his cousin lived in our house. And then we found some other people. And then there was a family because we're like, who died here? There was a family who had an infant that died during the time that they owned the house. So I don't know if they were in the house, if they had property, if this was the only property. I think it was a lot of property at that period in time. Um. And yeah, so we think at least a baby died here. So maybe there's like a baby ghost. Man. I'm not surprised. sure about anybody else though. Yeah. So what did you, when you saw something, what was it you saw? Okay. So it was late at night because my husband was asleep and I was sitting up reading and the room that I'm in is between our bedroom, which is over here and the bathroom, which is right here. So I was coming back from the bathroom this way and I was getting ready to go to bed. And the lights were mostly off, but I walked by this space right here, was right here. And I usually have a bar cart here. And above the bar cart, I saw out of the, like from the side, a silhouette, like just the head and torso. There was nothing below it because the bar cart's there. And it was just like a, like a mannequin shaped black silhouette. And I'm not like a I'm not even spiritual you know what I mean like I don't believe I went to Catholic school and then I immediately like threw it all away like I don't believe in that but in that moment I was like that's a ghost I I ran to my bed I pulled the covers all the way up and and then I was like ghosts don't have bodies they can't hurt you it probably just has I was like I was completely in that moment I was like that was a ghost and I saw it and it's not gonna hurt me and that you know it was so real in that moment so a lot of (laughs) what I'm, you know, kind of exploring is like, what happens if your belief system just changes, you know, like, what if you just suddenly are like, oh no, I believe this now. Uh, And how does does that work in a marriage, you know, because people change religions, sure. But like, sometimes they get divorced too. So (laughs) my gosh, your entire belief system changes. That's kind of a destabilizing event. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay. I totally, I totally want to read it. (laughs) And I want to come over your house with a psychic. Yes. Um, 
I am obsessed with, uh, with ghosts and hauntings and I have traveled all over. Like I never leave my house unless my husband is like, we can go to a haunted hotel. We can go, to, <laughs> you, do, you, do you need to go? You want to go to some like abandoned asylum? Okay. We can go along the way. Um, and never, I never see anything every time I'm like, and people are always like, Oh, look, it's, and I'm like, no, that's, that's this, that's, I'm the skeptic. Who's like, I don't want an answer. I want it. I want to be like, yes, there's something on the other side, but <laughs> instead I'm the person who's going, mm, no, that's not how that works. This is sign. No, no. Um, oh, that's fascinating. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we have a, a, a question in our Q and A. Uh, from Janine, would you consider expanding the Silent Queen story into its own book, starting one or two generations before the events in the Parliament? There's so much amazing history touched on that you implied on, and I want more same. Ooh, that's such, I had not considered that, but I like the idea. I, I The fairy tale was so different for me to write because it's I had not ever written anything quite like that. So yeah, I would like to, I would revisit that world. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot, you know, a lot of history that could be, I hadn't even considered that, but thank you. Cause now I might write it. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I really liked about the, the continuing theme of the, so in the silent queen, the monster appeared as somebody that you would trust and the, um, was it Valentina? Was that her name? Lucas's mom? Um, probably. Probably. Okay, good. I'm, I'm I was like, I don't remember what happened in this book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. She was, she was talking about uh, a particular spirit that comes to children that shows up in the form of somebody that you're afraid of. And then the murder owls have their own like barometric pressure thing that makes you also see like you're the thing that you're most scared of or your, you know, worst memory. Um, and, and I love that it, it was, coming in and out like woven through there all of these different stories because it does seem like every every culture has a a story like that and I, I loved that this one um especially with you know the silent queen you you get a little deeper into it but with the parliament it was just kind of left open-ended of why is it why why does it and and is it are you haunted by your are you haunted by your um your worst memory or was it your closest memory to death or your I really wanted to do the science behind it I wanted to be like <laughs> have them all go out have somebody who's never been touched by death what are they seeing <laughs> what would a baby see what right? yes what would a baby see <laughs> baby their birth. they would see their birth probably <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna be terrifying I mean come on <laughs> so cold all of a sudden right exactly. yeah, I always think that about me there of course they cry it's so cold it's cold it's somebody screaming the lights are on oh yeah the worst let's see let me double check and make sure i've got all of my questions at, oh my god i actually got i got to all of them and we got done early oh my gosh yay this was fantastic is there anything that you want to add I don't think so. I'm just, I'm so grateful for you, uh, for choosing the book and everyone who read it. Thank you. Even if you didn't like it, I <laughs> appreciate you picking it up and oh. it thrills me. I let book clubs are my favorite thing in the whole world. I just, I always find my people in book clubs. So it always thrills me when I see one reading my book well, and I they, always hope that people like fight about it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like please fight about my book. Right, because then you then you know that people are like really. People have strong opinions. Then I'm like, I did my job. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um. Yeah. No. I. I was. I was completely in. It was a. It was one of those where I started reading it, and then I was like, Well, I'm. I'm not going to do anything else today because this is. This is the end. <laughs> um. So thank you for being here. Um. Thank you everybody for uh coming and watching let's see we just sent you what was it an education in malice which i think everybody should have received i'm really bad with my months um and uh all i can say is um sexy vampires it's very good it is a very i don't know if you know the difference between open door and closed door romance it is open door uh so just just be aware of that um and then the next month 
is what did I do with it is um I'm not going to say it right but I really liked it Diavola Diavola I don't know how to I don't know where the where the pronunciation goes but oh my god y'all look at this cover Great cover oh my god a creepy Italian via family reunion what is more terrifying family reunion that's way more terrifying <laughs> it's so good um and also, uh, if you are a horror aficionado, the, I don't know if you guys have read, um, oh my God, what is the, what was the first one? My Heart is a Chainsaw was the first one Stephen Graham Jones wrote, and I can't remember the second one. Um, my Heart is a Chainsaw, so, so good. One of my favorite books ever. The second one, it was good, but like it's the second in a trilogy. It's always, you know, they're, they're trying to do this, trying to do that. It was good. The third one um, is coming out in uh the end of march and i got an arc um angel of indian lake and um and i will tell you if you have been waiting to read all three of them to make sure that they really are good it is so good so it's absolutely worth it to get into the trilogy oh don't fear the reaper you are right colleen thank you that is the second one um which was good but it's always second books are always unsatisfying third one wrapped it all up mm. although i will pay big money for somebody to start like a wikipedia for books because i can never remember i get to the i'm like what happened in the first book what happened in the second book i don't fucking remember i don't have time to go back and reread those books again like i ugh. also why don't publishers put the number in the series on the cover as a parent who has children who loves books and series i do not want to have to google the title for every book to figure out which book is next just put a yes. little number Please, I'm begging you. Exactly, exactly, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, and yeah, and I think we're all, I think we're all caught up. So, thank you guys so much, and thank you, Amy, for for being here. This was lots of fun, and yeah, I can't wait to read your your haunted house <laughs> book. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. Sure, bye everybody. Bye.